This is our review of chapter six, uh, the first of two chapters on outliers. Outliers are numbers or a single number that is much larger or much smaller than everything else in the data set. We're not necessarily interested in a single number. We're interested in to see whether there are groups of numbers that are larger or smaller than uh, normal, because these could be errors or fraud. We have three main tests that we talk about in the chapter. The summation test, which is Benford Law related, simply getting the largest and looking at the largest gross. So let's uh, have a look here. The first one is the summation test. Now, Benford's law is based on the counts. We simply count how many numbers start with 10, 11, 12, all the way up to 99. The summation test takes those same numbers but instead of counting them, it sums them. So we're going to look at some examples of huge errors that we hope would have been detected by this summation test. Let's have a look here. Kenneth Steen was expecting a $513 tax refund. Instead, he got a bill. You owe us $300 million and change. An IRS official says about 3,000 other people got similar erroneous notices showing a balance due of $300 million and change. Well, a few things come to mind. Number one, these are huge numbers. And if I simply counted them, my Benford Law graph might look quite uh, good. But if I take the sum of these numbers, these definitely would be an outlier. Now, if I multiply 3,000 by that number, I get a number that's approximately equal to 10% of the gross domestic product of the United States of America at that time. Uh, I would have expected the IRS to have picked up an error equal to 10% of the gross domestic product before those letters were mailed. Number two, the IRS is lucky that this is a balance due notice. If they had sent out 3,000 refund checks for $300 million, they would still now be looking for some of those taxpayers who would be long gone. Denise, this is the Ohio Department of Taxation. Denise, you wanted a refund for two cents, but instead we will give you a refund for $200 million. So this is a rather large error, uh, $200 million. And we hope that if we uh, looked at the sum of all the numbers with two zero, we would pick this up. Incidentally, I think that two cents is a string of zeros with a two at the end, and it looks as if the computer turned it on upside down and went with a two and a string of zeros at the end. If you Google bank error, uh, you will find numerous cases, and here is another one of somebody who got rather lucky and got 8.2 million dollars in error. You can simply Google something like bank error and you should find large errors. Now, with the summation test, I look at the sum of all the numbers beginning with one zero, all the way up to the sum of all the numbers beginning with double nine. What we can see here is that the sum of all the numbers beginning with two four is much larger than its neighbors, and the sum of all the numbers beginning with double nine is much larger than all of its neighbors. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, extract all the numbers that begin with double nine, and I'm going to put the largest at the top because it's the largest numbers that are causing this spike at double nine. Here we go. This is the Washington DC purchasing card transactions. And look at this. We have a number of numbers coming in fractionally below 100,000. We have numbers coming in 100 up to $500 below. Five, uh, 100,000. And this is actually quite amazing. This is purchasing card transactions. 100,000 on a purchasing card is extremely high and is uh, probably needs a, a few levels of approvals. Anyway, the summation test worked. It told me I have some large numbers beginning with double nine and there they are. It told me that I have uh, numbers beginning with two four and now it's not that clear what we can see though if we scroll all the way down we would see lots and lots of numbers in the 2400 to the 2500 dollar mark and indeed 2500 dollars was the maximum allowed 
for a P card transaction before a higher approval is required. And we can see all these transactions a year, and they're probably more, coming in one penny below the maximum allowed. They are, these are what I call threshold numbers. They are coming in just below a control threshold, and they warrant another look. Now, our red flags needn't always be quantitative. This was Michael. Michael was the controller. Michael earned about 100 to 200,000 per year. Michael had a massive Bank of America um, brokerage account. He also had this $3 million home in Brigantine, New Jersey. The case is rather interesting. And uh, Michael was discovered because of the extravagance of his uh, daughter's wedding and because the owner found out about this uh, little mansion by the beach. I took this photo myself. I went to the mansion and I spoke to the owner, the new owner, that is. Uh, we had a nice long chat. I can just tell you that he didn't let me in the house, but he spoke to me at the front door for as long as I wanted to talk about his nice house and the previous owner, Tom. Now, our second test, the largest subsets. Let me break down my data into subsets, little groups, and just give me the largest. And uh, why this test is effective is because fraudsters generally don't know when to stop. They go, they just keep going. And so here we go. They don't know when to stop. A hotel clerk put his own ID on the reservations for people that checked into the hotel but weren't members of the program. Uh, well, he did this so many times that he was sort of one of the highest point getters uh, in the hotel chain. And of course, you can pick this ease up easily if you just say who got the most points for the last year. Over time, another favorite of fraudsters. Um, and what this test would simply say is who got the most overtime? And uh, maybe it is true, and maybe it is probably more likely um, fraudulent. So I have a number of examples in the book. This is a nice test to run, quite easy. And indeed, if I go to a, a access, I can do the query, group by count and sum, and I'm grouping it by merchant. And uh, access has got a number of good points. One of them is that I can take these results um, right here. And if I run my query, I run it, I will get a sort of a messy output in query form. But look how fast I did it. And that was about 193 transactions, 193,000 transactions. And for each merchant, it got the total and the, the count and the sum. Now, the nice thing about Access, it has the reports feature, and I can turn this sort of um, primitive looking uh, set of results into a very nice report in Access. Access is very versatile, and it can do some rather nifty things. Now, related to this is the largest subset growth. Tell me which subset could be uh, um, points getters, it could be employees, which subset grew, or it could be vendors. Which subset had a really large growth spurt? Um, and if a vendor has a massive growth spurt from year to year, it could be because this is a fraud vendor and uh, the employee doesn't know when to stop and they just keep going on and on and the vendor grows and grows. So this is the purchasing card data. And I just want to reiterate, if we actually go to the book right over here, it's not so clear which sums I'm taking over there. Uh, we'll go back to the PowerPoint. This is the sum for that vendor for 2009 to 2011. I'm taking the last two digits of 09 and 11, three years. This is the sum from 2012 to 2014, three years. And I'm taking the last two digits of the first and the last. And I had this dash means from here to there. Now. I have some massive gross percentages over here, and usually I have to tidy these results up because if I have a very low starting point, $8, and then I go to 40,000, this is a massive gross percentage, but most of this number is because this number is so small 
as opposed to some real um, growth. And in fact, uh, all of these look rather odd. Uh, I would, I would uh, change the time periods and do some trial and error. This is a nice case study. I like this. And you have this um, report in the Dropbox. Uh, you can read it yourself. And what we have here is a vendor that showed explosive growth over a period of time and uh, some distinctive patterns in their um, invoicing. And um, with that explosive growth, uh, the largest subset test uh, should have picked it up. So you can read that, you, or you can simply read the um, summary in the chapter. It makes for interesting reading. One thing which allowed this fraud to get so big and uh, so blatant was because of collusion. Somebody internally was working with the vendor, uh, the uh, auto repair shop, and they were approving the invoices knowing that they were fraudulent. We had, uh, this, so this involved collusion and kickbacks, and this is very difficult to detect uh, in, at a corporate level, but with analytics, we can see the explosive growth and it became quite obvious, although obvious with hindsight. This is another um, example that I talk about. And this was somebody that had an account that accumulated Delta Airlines points, um, but they did so fraudulently by deception. They were not entitled to the points. And we talk about the point balance getting up to 42 million. And I think that this would have been an outlier and it would have had a large growth. And we might have detected it using analytics. If you do, do look at the case um, details, it does seem that Delta did pick this up and the, the indictments refer to conversations between uh, Delta's risk management employees and the owner. R. R can do larger subsets rather easily. And indeed, a lot of this is sort of fluff because I am removing data that is no longer needed. However, I can do my import and we always need to do that step. But the larger subset test calculations, everything is pretty much done over here. Just a few lines. Uh, this is sorting the data set so that I get the largest at the top and write the results to a CSV file. R is very efficient. And if you actually do use this and you run it, you will be amazed at the execution speed. It's hard to believe that these results uh, come about in less than one second. The output looks rather primitive. However, what we can do is we can write the results to a CSV file. When you have this in Excel, you can tidy it up and uh, you'll have something really nice looking. So we're looking for outliers. We're looking for, we have the summation test. We have the largest and the largest growth tests. And what this is, this is, uh, these are the two tests that we have just spoken about now. These are where we started in chapter two, data profile, histogram, a periodic graph. And so what we've done as we move up, we have become more and more focused and we have focused on smaller and smaller groups of highly anomalous transactions. By the time we're here with the largest growth tests, we'll have a few vendors that really look odd or a few vendors that are really big, um, as opposed to these ones that looked at the entire data set and was looking for huge data errors or large anomalies. So, summary. The summation test tells us whether we have a few very large transactions or a larger group of medium-sized transactions. It's Benford's law based, and the big ones will pop out. If we use the normal Benford test, it simply counts the number of records and the number 300 million and the number three both have a first digit three and the Benford's law would treat, would treat those two numbers the same. The largest subset, they don't know when to stop. Just give me the largest. The largest growth, well, this one is growing so, so fast, uh, it, looks, uh, it, it looks like uh, we need to take uh, some audit attention here. So the goal is to say which type of abnormal duplications could signal errors, fraud, or processing inefficiencies, and then to design the tests accordingly. And so um, 
on that note, that is the end of chapter 6. And uh, coming up next would be our review of chapter 7.